Ladies and gentlemen, please make her welcome, one of our judges and star presenters, Anne Gribbins. I think I need to start a little bit with the history of dressage in the United States to give you an idea of the time frame and the process, how it developed in the United States. 50 years ago, dressage was basically an unknown discipline in the US. And there were small groups nestling here and there on the East Coast and in California. And they were usually inspired by somebody who grew up in Europe and, and uh, had lo learned to ride there. But it wasn't important in its own right. In the early 1970s, there was a growing interest in training horses for the sole purpose of dressage. And then in 1973, the United States Dressage Federation was established by its founder, Lowell Boomer. And he had its headquarters put in Lincoln, Nebraska, which is, in a way, the center of America. But of course, nobody lives there. So, you know, it was, but it was the center. And that's, it proved to become a huge boost for dressage in the United States. Um, they found, people came and they found a place to discuss and network and share their enthusiasm. And it also created like a ladder of national procedures and awards to encourage internal competition. I worked on several of the committees and chaired them too. And it, would, could, it could be a wild ride, you know, when everybody got a place to actually talk. And as Ricky said, um, the powers that were uh, the National Federation were not that interested in the subject at the time. So now there was a place where the dressage people could meet and develop programs. But um, the, U the forming of the USDF also woke up the National Federation and they did pay a lot more attention after that. And in the beginning, they were a little bit backed off because they thought this was going to be, going to be a rival to their powers. But, and there were some battles. But over the years, the dust settled, and today the USDF is in charge of most national concerns, while the United States Equestrian Federation is concerned with the international competitions and team matters, as well as licensing officials. Both headquarters are now situated in Lexington, Lexington Kentucky, right next to each other. In the 1700s and early 80s, we were getting our bearings as a dressage nation. <clears throat> we imported instructors from various parts of Europe, some of them very good trainers who did their best to get us on track. Everybody who rode at that time and was serious went for training overseas and clinics at home. I spent a total of two and a half years in Germany on three tours with several different horses, and this was not unusual since consistent long-term help was just not available in the US at the time. The US did employ, at different times, three good team coaches, George Theodoresco, Mello von Bruggen, and Klaus Balkenhol to help us. The problem was that they all had businesses at home, and they would only come in for maybe two weeks in the spring and two weeks in the fall, and there was no real continuity in that work. So we did have one coach, in the early 70s that, that was domiciled in the United States. He was a, a colonel in the Swedish cavalry and a seven-time Olympian and in both riding and fencing. His name was Bengt Junquist. Under his leadership, the US earned a bronze medal in Canada in Bromont in 1976. And one of the riders you will maybe know or remember was Hilda Gurney. We um, often speak loosely, sort of, about uh, um, icons and legends, but Hilda is truly a living legend. She routinely traveled from California, pulling her American thoroughbred Keen across the entire country to come and work where Colonel Jonquist was uh, located 
in Maryland, right next to Washington, D.C. And she kept doing this trip. We were all there training with Banks, and she kept coming, and she thought nothing of it. You know, it took us a week to get there and a week to go home. And Keen was one of these really special, breathtaking horses which will really stay on your mind. And since he was not an imported warm blood from Europe or trained there, he caused extra attention. And so did some brave competitors, such as Robert Dover, who showed up in Europe to compete. And he told me <laughs> that he made, an, made coming last into an art form. <laughs> so, so he was one of the groundbreakers. But he kept going into the ring, and eventually the Europeans had to give him credit, and first for guts and perseverance, and then for doing a really good job. The next Olympic bronze for us was 1992 in Barcelona, and there our star was gifted. Carol Lavelle's giant bay. I think he was a Hanoverian. I watched gifted being trained from the beginning, for even as a four-year-old, and he was trained by Michael Pollan, and I saw him in different clinics and competitions his whole life. And I saw him change from a lumbering baby Yui to an, a powerful athlete. So the this effort was then followed by another bronze in Atlanta in 1996. And uh, our riders there were Michelle Gibson on Perron, Gunther Seidel on Graf George, and Robert Dover on Metallic. This, by the way, was the first time that freestyle was introduced in the Olympic Games. After this, it would take 20 years <laughs> to 2016 for the Americans to once again stand on Olympic podium. So after the resignation of Klaus Balkenhall as our US team coach, we had nobody in that position for several years. And then I was voted in uh, by the competitors, by the elite riders, as technical advisor and coach in 2009. This was the first time for an American citizen to hold that uh, position and also, of course, for a, for a judge. When I first sat down, I actually was in Windsor judging the um, European Championships, and I sat down with the then leaders of our uh, federation, and I asked them for a job description, and they just looked at me and said, you figure it out. <laughs> so I did or I tried to, um, I saw it as my most important duty to establish an educational pipeline for development of our elite athletes. I knew from trying out for various teams, from being involved in the team training for many years, and for, in riding for the United States and Argentina, how the system worked and where we needed to improve. And I knew we were weak at that moment because of lack of horses being developed for the future. The tendency among US riders for a while had been to buy or have a sponsor buy a trained horse in Europe and get on the team for us. However, in the end game, they didn't get very far at the games. So this went on for many years. And I, I just knew that training horses is the important part, and of course also riders. So I had a vision of starting to establish a program with developing coaches. I wanted one on each coast, and I picked Debbie McDonald, uh, and that seemed to be a stroke of genius in the end, and um, Robert for the West Coast, and Robert Dover for the East Coast. Well, Robert had already committed himself to Canada, and the USEF was not too enthusiastic about paying for two developing coaches. So Debbie McDonald took the job. And then Scott Hasler had already worked with the young horses, so he was a given for the young horse coach. So I wanted a developing coach, a young horse coach. Then uh, we looked for a young rider, junior coach, and the committee picked Jeremy Steinberg uh, because he was younger and, you know, more in tune with the internet and all this and with the kids. Um, and um, this way, there, was the, there were the four of us. 
So uh, by 2010, we were off with a group of four to work with, with those tasks all over the country. And we traveled a lot. I, I ran around like a witch on a broom all over the United States. And I'll tell you, it's a big country. Because, and it was, you know, five horses were here, six were there, two had to be looked at there. And, but it was important that they had somebody who was a go-to person that could go and evaluate the horses, help their trainers along, and also be approachable so that they had somebody to, well, we just talked about that here, you know, that they can come up to you and go, hey, I, I have this problem. And I tried to do that as much as possible. At times, I, got, I gave these clinics too to the elite athletes and got a little help sometimes from Stefan, Peters, and Gunther Seidel, who both had ridden for, for the States. And gradually, the concept sort of took form, and it became accepted by the riders, and they even looked to be invited into these clinics and special training sessions. For my entire tenure, I clamored for a pony coach. We had the perfect person available in London Gray. It was like the Pied Piper with the kids. And the, but the financial crisis that we I still lived in, we still lived in, we had no money, uh, from 2008 still loomed. And the request was denied. To this day, I think that was a mistake. I think it's a mistake not to have a pony coach or to because then they said, well, we don't have any really pony riders. Well, my feeling is uh, if you give the party, they will come. You have to get, make something available to them. And we have millions of ponies that jump little fences and, and go in equitation, but no real pony riders. And my reason for wanting this is that I think ponies make better um, teachers for young children. And along with supporting their child as a pony rider, the parents learn all about the competition. So very often the whole family gets involved, as we have seen in Europe, how that works. You know, they have these children, they ride ponies, then they go up and suddenly they're on the team. And uh, it absolutely is, a, is a, a, a way, a gateway to having everybody on track. What happens with us is that we can have young riders and junior riders very good. They go to the championship, you know, to the FEI Young Rider Championships. They do well, and we never hear from them again. They sort of, because they don't have the family support or that. So there, there's something I still think that we need to, to fix. So, well, my first experience bringing a team to a game was in 2010. I think it, and then a uh, first time, <laughs> I wanted to do a European tour with the horses. Well, there weren't many horses available, but we took what we had. And we went, amongst other places, to Fritzens, which is in, up in the Alps, and the Swarovski show. And oh, if you ever want to go to a beautiful show, this is, the, the, the environment is fantastic. And we um, took one of our, this is one of our riders, Tina Conyot, who was hopeful for the 2000 games. And then we went on to um, Germany, and that's Eva Solomon, who was my dressage uh, director. And uh, there, that's total us. And you can see I'm in awe, yeah. <laughs> so, but we, we did some touring, and I have to see, say that you know, we, we did fairly well with it. For the team, in, before the team, um, we had Gladstone, New Jersey preparations, and um, I had on the team in the end uh, three what we call rookies. They had never ridden on a team before. That was Catherine Bateson, Tina Conyot, Todd Flederich, and the only one that had any experience was Stephen Peters. So about eight weeks before they were all supposed to travel to Gladstone, I get a call from Stefan, and he says, well, there's a problem with Ravel with one, one of his feet, and uh, we don't know what it is, and I think we may not be able to fix it, and I don't think we can come. Well, 
here I was with three riders who had never ridden on a team. And of course, I was counting on Stefan to be leading the whole show and for them to be confident because there, he was there. Well, my blood ran cold and I didn't know what to do. So I was talking to the owner of Ravel, who is also a great sponsor of our sport in the States, Aikiko Yamasaki. And I explained to her how I felt about this whole thing. And she said, well, you know, we're not sure. And if you really feel like it, I could actually send Ravel to Gladstone from California uh, if you think that it would help the team spirit. And she did. Doors was still not perfectly sound when he arrived like a month before. But because we have great farriers and great veterinarians, somehow they figured it out. And two weeks before showtime, the horse was perfect. And Akiko was richly rewarded because the horse, uh, Ravel, got two individual medals with Stefan. So it was all what, what, you know, it all ended well. But that was a very nervous time. And it was great to have him there because as team coach, if you have all, all of the members have never done this before, it can get pretty interesting. There are many moving parts to being the coach with, you know, everyone being so in intense and so worried. And, and of course, we have the horses to worry about too. Uh, our next effort as a team was the Pan Am Games in Guadalajara in Mexico. We fielded a very strong team at the um, medium level or at the small tour. And uh, actually, we swept all three individual medals and the team gold. So this had never happened before in the history of the Pan Am Games. And I was very excited. And it was a great moment <laughs> when the organizer came up to us before the award ceremonies and said, <clears throat> could we borrow some flags from you because we have run out of American flags. <laughs> so going to, oh, this is the, yeah, this is when we were at Gladstone and that's right next to New York City, of course. So the whole team went off and, you know, played in New York and took a tour on the ferry. And uh, then this is the arena at Gladstone. And uh, in the middle between the team members is Courtney King. You may remember the girl that felt that was an athlete that I lost. She was one of my top athletes and she, I worked with her and the day after I heard that she had, her, uh, her horse actually stumbled at the walk and she fell off and so damaged you know, her head and her brain that, well, you, the whole, she was the reason that we all are wearing helmets today. That's how the whole thing with the helmets started. So then anyway, here we are, the team. <laughs> Would you enjoy that one? And to the, to the left is our veterinarian, Dr. Mitchell, and I'll tell you, we've had super crews with that. He is a very, very good vet. And then we went on to Kentucky. And uh, I don't have many pictures because I thought this is not a picture show, but it's just you know, to give you some images. And then, you know, Stefan did great, of course. And there's Ravel in a stall. So moving on. Oh, I did that. Oh, yeah. This, this is the, so this is the Pan Am preparations. Different, different group. And this was our young horse that later became the alternate for London, uh, Heather Blitz. And she, Paragon, fantastic horse. Unfortunately, didn't go very far after that. So um, there's Stefan, and there's another one of my, my alternates. While we were training in, at Gladstone, where did it go? And there we are at the Pan Am Games. And uh, it, it was a great show, beautiful venue. This is how, if you haven't shipped horses, in, you know, this was the ramp they went on uh, when they were flying. And, you know, you, you had to take part in all this. It's a very exciting journey. journey. That was the country club and uh, looking out from the country club in, the, in Mexico. Here is our team all dressed up. And there they are. 
when we were still, they came and took some picture. Yeah, I think that was after the competition. Anyway, now we are in England. Uh, we had a, a, a lovely place in the Keynes place outside of Leon in England. And we stayed there for at least a month in training. And that's Jim Wolf, that was our director of uh, sports. And we went punting on the river next to the colleges and, you know, just en enjoyed. And I will say on this, team spirit is a very fragile thing. It can be a great time when all the members support each other. It's a wonderful thing. And if they don't, it's a horror to be. It's better that they're all angry at the coach. This is fine. Then, then they are working together. I'd rather have that. But when one of them gives you trouble, it it's, can really ruin the whole thing. And there are times when you know, they come to the Grand Prix as a team, and once they get to the special, <laughs> just gone. So yeah, that was um, a big learning curve for me, that what happens when you're that Involved. Another thing I found is that it's always the squeaky wheel that gets the most oil. So it's your, your weakest link you spend all the time hand-holding and talking, etc. until the other members go, well, you know, is that your favorite? No, this is the one that needs the most help. <laughs> and it's, so it, it can be very confusing, and, and, but it was, it's interesting. So anyway... Um, Having judged, now when we, when we got to Greenwich Park, which by the way was built up over the ground because they wouldn't let the horses step on the grass in Greenwich Park, including the platform that we competed on. So we were up on this platform that was on poles and that's where the dressage arena was. And actually, it, when some of the music of the, because I was standing up in the uh, kiss and cry area, uh, with, and, and when they, we played the music, that if the music had a very strong, low you know, tones and bass, the whole platform would tremble. <laughs> and that is, that is, in my opinion, the reason that we, uh, I had spent now years with Ravel. I knew the horse very well. When he came into the freestyle in London, he, he went a few steps uh, you know, after, the, after halting, and then he, he stopped and he looked down like a horse that you're trying to bring over a bridge or you know, something. He stopped and he looked down like this, and then, okay, then he listened, he went on. He did that three times during the test. And I'm standing there with Akiko, and we have no idea what, what, what made the horse do this. You know, this is a horrible thing. To, and it wasn't about Stefan or the test or the movement, something else. And then I realized that the whole podium where we were standing was also trembling because Stefan had this really strong music, you know, very strong bass. Now, the problem was that we should have gone there with the horse and practiced because we may have, un have noticed it then. But we, didn't, we were so sure about the music. We'd done it so many times, and we just went and played it and listened to it but we didn't bring the horse on that platform. So, you know, these are things, hindsight is 2020. But, so anyway, we heard before about money in the sport. Well, we had a bit of a struggle all the way along when I was the coach with the money because we weren't, hadn't recovered from the financial crisis. So when I listened to Prime Minister David Cameron giving a speech right after the huge British success in the London <laughs> Summer Olympics, for all the athletes, he explained that all the promising athletes in England were fully supported for years, actually, some of them, by the English National Lottery. So I was green with envy. And I thought, well, this is marvelous because this would solve a lot of problems because it's true, this is a very, very expensive sport. So, but after I resigned and Robert Dover, after some months, took over my position, 
he also was very aware because we talked and he says, yes, that's the main thing. And he started fact, it, his own program. You know this uh, thing, uh, America has talent program? Well, he did the same thing for, athlete, for all riders. And it really took, took off. And he made enough money to send the team for the European tours. So this is one way that you can, yeah, you know, pay. Not that we were not su uh, supported by the US EF, because once you made it on the team, then there was no problem. They would pay for everything and, and ship you in style and uh, do everything right at the venue. They did a beautiful job with all that, but you had to get to the team. And the problem with that is the expenses and so on. Also, since I'm a judge, I had figured, okay, this is an additional you know, perk, we can, we can do mock shows. Well, <laughs> to my surprise, there was a limited uh, enthusiasm about this in the beginning, because I found that although we practiced these movements again and again and again, when it came to actually sh having them judged, oh, uh, well, now wait a minute, my horse just you know, looked at me cross-eyed this morning. I don't think, I, 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 they, it was very funny. In the beginning, they were very hedgy about this. They didn't really want to know the truth. But, <laughs> but they, got, they, they, they got used to it. And finally, now we have it in our programs regularly that we always have judged to come and judge them, but not at first. They got on board after a while, though. So another small in, internal issue that we, that came to mind uh, is that there's always an, an, an alternate on the team. And that's a horrible position for anybody because you're the extra and you don't get to play. And I, in, back in the dark age, ages, I was an alternate for a team. And I sat there and waited with my horse and I watched them all get dressed and photographed and then and boom, and off they went to the team and nobody, you know, and then they sent me home. But I was also on the high performance committee at the time. So I said, no, no, that's got to change. If you become an alternate, then you better be treated as an, an athlete that made the team. Because you did, it's not your fault that, you know, and then you're gonna be ready to take over if somebody else can't. And from, from there on, we always do treat our alternates as team in any way, even when they don't travel with us. So, and also we had, when. I did have a few little issues with behavior of the athletes when they, you know, they, they just had an attitude and they didn't want to play uh, a team play and be, uh, you know, behave appropriately, wanted to do their own thing, such as leaving, <laughs> leaving to go to a horse show when we're all in quarantine, you know, and these bizarre things. So <laughs> then we drew up certain rules. Once you are on a team in the United States, you have to have a conditions that you sign about your behavior as well. So gradually we sorted these things out little by little. Well, another interesting point is how sponsorship works or doesn't. Um, you'd think that every sponsor of a horse would be, as we just heard, uh, from Mr. Snow, you would pick the best horse and the best rider to ride it. This would be why you would want to spend your money to sponsor. And uh, traveling around the country, I saw many riders that didn't have the horse. How many good riders are there really that never have the right horse? And I saw some excellent horses that had the wrong rider. So I was just waiting for some of these sponsors or, or potential sponsors to come and say, do you have any ideas? But you know, that's a weird thing, sponsorship, because very often they would just pick their friends. To, and this was, and then they got cemented together and it, it wasn't normally what happened. And that was fine, and I'm sure it still doesn't. It's, it's a different thing, but you know, a sponsor that wants to get someplace, of course, should pick the best combination and not just they're somebody who, who they like. In the meantime, while we were at the Olympics, and by the way, we were sixth, and I was not surprised because I had seen the, the horses 
that were available while judging them earlier. And we did not have good enough. We, the riders were good, and they did their best. And the horses got the highest you know, score they could, actually. But it wasn't good enough because they, the horses, the material in horses in Europe had already passed us by. And I knew that. But they fought well, and we, were, we had to be pleased with that. Um, in the meantime, um, at home, we were training young riders and younger generations. Um, I myself worked with Laura Grace for three and a half years, and also Casey Perry off and on, and, and Alison Brooke on Roosevelt. Um, these were in, were in the pipeline at home. And then they moved on to Debbie McDonald, and she took them on, and they won after 20 years an Olympic bronze in Brazil. And then the team silver, of course, in trial in 2018. What I want, an important point to make is that none of those young people were forced to go to Europe for training. They were home trained. They only needed to go to Europe for shows. To this, that was a big, to me, to this, but this was a big step forward for American dressage. And also a sign that our USCF pipeline was working. These days, Debbie has taken over as technical advisor and coach. Charlotte Bridal is developing coach. George Williams is young rider and, um, and young rider and junior coach. And Christine Traurig is um, our young horse coach. And those are all riders that have represented the US internationally. There are also regular training sessions in different areas of the country advice and some financial help because we are in a much better spot financially. And the USCF makes available personal counseling with a sports psychologist, physical training programs, and for the athletes as well as the horses and sports horse management courses. So they are, once you're in the pipeline, you they making all these things available, and it's it's really wonderful to see for me who, you know, started with nothing. So I'm sharing all this with you to give you an idea of how we gradually put ourselves together to get back in the game. And um, to to as always, of course. The supply of available horses and riders ebbs and flows. It does this in all country, countries, even Germany. And you know, the, the, it, sometimes they have real top horses and sometimes they don't, or they lose one and then it's not so good. So I don't know, I'm not certain how strong we will be this year at the games, but I do know that we are busy developing our own riders and horses at home. And in the final analysis, at the very top of the game, the horse and rider who win are the ones that grow together in, with time. And thank you so much for listening to me. And I am so impressed with this facility. I took a tour this morning for two hours uh, <laughs> together with two Kiwis. And they showed me the whole property and all the statues and everything. I have never seen anything like it. I'm still digesting it, but I can promise you that WEG is going to be here not long from now. <laughs>